I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Arakwell people of the Bunjalung Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Human Design Podcast with me, your host, Emma Dunwoody. I'm a qualified master coach and human behavior specialist, as well as being a qualified human design coach. And I work with clients every single day to answer the big questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And what is my purpose? I also assist them to transition from the person they think they should be to the person they really are on the inside. I teach people how to actually live their design instead of just knowing it. And if this is something that you want to do too, well, stay tuned or reach out for private coaching or human design unpacks where I show you exactly how to live your design. Before we get into today's episode, I want to share something really amazing with you. And it's actually one of our new Millions of Millionaires sponsors. So... To introduce this body graph chart software that we've been using that's been mind-blowing. So I want to welcome the amazing um, Taylor Jason, who is my incredible operations manager. Welcome along, Taylor. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. This is actually um, something that we implemented when? Um, April. Yeah. And this year. we were just trialing it out because they'd reached out to us um, in regards to sponsoring the podcast or something like that, wasn't it? And so it kind of wasn't mm-hmm. even on our radar and we tried it out and we had such low expectations. And then what happened? Well, I remember sending you a message going, Emma, why are we not using this? Because I was mind blown. You know, we get a lot of requests for stuff like that. And, you know, there's new softwares all the time. And I clicked on it, like you said, with very low expectations. And I started looking through what they can do. And I had, I got so excited. You know, the MG in me was like, oh my God, we have to use this. And I saw the potential of it and it has delivered more than expected. It's really awesome. Amazing. Now, before we get into the actual numbers, because I know um, numbers with Taylor is a thing in our business. She loves to share all the all the numbers. Let's just tell the listeners exactly who it's for and what it is. Yeah. So it's a great tool for anyone who uses human design in their business. So if you're a human design reader, a human design coach, or just someone who uses human design in your business, if you, you know, incorporated into whatever you do, it's a way for you to embed an actual human design chart tool into your website. So, you know, if you want someone to get their human design chart, you probably send them to an outside platform somewhere, you know, oh, go to this website, put in your details and get your chart, whatever that platform might be. There's a couple big ones. And what's cool about this is that it allows you to put that tool on your own website and it's yours. So when someone comes and, you know, puts their information into your website, they get their chart and then you can hook up, hook it up to your email list, to your newsletter. You can have it linked to your own content. You can customize the reports afterwards that they get, you know, so it's your own descriptions of what, you know, this type is or this profile. So that's kind of what it is. Oh my God, I love it. And it's so cool because I actually remember when Jenna Zoe, because it must be the same software that Jenna Zoe used and before anyone else. Yeah, right. And I was always like, wow, her chart looks so beautiful and it's on her website. That's so cool. So yeah, when we started using it, I was like, this is beautiful. I'm really excited that we can do it. But let's talk hard numbers. Like we have had some serious success with this, um, just adding this to our business. So tell everyone a little bit about the growth that we've experienced through using this. Yeah. So since implementing it into our website in April, there have been over 4,000 people that have downloaded their chart through the website. And that's unique. That's not, um, you know, someone who does it twice because a lot of people will go back because they won't download the PDF or something, or they lost it or misplaced it. That's unique um, chart downloads. So it's even more for double for people doing it twice. Um, and it's been really amazing. It's more than tripled the size of the email list. And, you know, you can set up you know, sequences afterwards for people to, um, you know, give them more information and keep everything in-house. Yeah. And because one of the really big things for us is obviously human design made simple. So it gives us the opportunity to 
um, give our way of teaching human design directly to the people who want it. And I love that. I love that every single person that wants to get their chart, that downloads it, we can then support them on their journey straight away, which is of course what you set up because you're amazing to make sure that not only do they get their chart, but they also get this support, free content support that helps them as they're you know, new to human design and on their journey. So beautiful. So how do people access this? What's it, what's it called? And I know that there's a benefit for listeners of the podcast. Yes. So you can go to the link in the show notes, or you can go to bodygraphchart.com. And they have been kind enough to give the listeners of the human design podcast, a 50% off discount for 12 months, which is huge because it's already inexpensive to begin with. Um, and then the 50% discount is going to put it at $25 a month. That's in us dollars. So wherever you are in the world, it'll be, you know, a little bit different, but, um, 50% off for 12 months. And the code is human design podcast. And we'll put that in the show notes too, for everyone. And one of the other things I want to say, that's really cool about this chart tool is that, it's 100% customizable and it actually gives Chiron and the four arrows, which is what a lot of chart tools don't do that. So that's one thing that a lot of people are drawn to when they go to get our chart from our website is, oh, I can get the arrows because of it or my Chiron gates. I love that. It's so cool. So check out the show notes, people get on it because really it is such a powerful and as Taylor says, inexpensive tool, like it paid for itself in the first two days. I seem to remember or first day I seem to remember. So it's so valuable. Um, and it gives you the opportunity to really build your brand and your communication with your clients. So thank you. Go check it out. Hey, Hey everyone. And welcome to today's episode. I am so excited to share this conversation with Alana Pratt with you guys today. It was so real and vulnerable and honest. And Alana shares um, her own experience of deeply unconscious patterns that had her calling in destructive, um, painful relationships and, and how she healed that and moved through it. And I really believe today's conversation is so incredibly empower empowering and no wonder Alana has had so much success. Let me tell you a little bit about this incredible human in case you haven't heard of her before. Um, Alana is an intimacy expert, global media personality and go-to authority for those that have suffered heartbreak and are ready to live unapologetically and attract an open-hearted ideal relationship. She's been chosen as an icon of influence, is a columnist on Good Men Project, and has been featured on Huffington Post, People Magazine, Forbes, CB CBS, ABC, Fox, TLC, and the Human Design Podcast now. Um, this Ivy League grad is the author of six books, has interviewed Whoopi Goldberg and Alanis Morissette, and hosts the edgy podcast, Intimate Conversations, where listeners learn how to find the relationship they actually deserve. A certified coach with close to 5 million viewers on YouTube, Alana was asked by Lisa Gibbons to coach her during Dancing with the Stars. This incredible human has such a, an extensive um, resume and even more than that, has an incredibly big heart and so much wisdom to share in this episode. So enjoy the episode. But like uh, the monks in Tibet, Tonglen, where they breathe in the suffering of the world and they exhale love and compassion, you can do mm -hmm. the same for man's attention. You can breathe in his maybe lower vibrational only bow chicka bow bow energy. You can breathe it in. You can affirm, yes, I am a divine temple. Thank you for noticing. And you can exhale that energy out. And I swear they change. They sit up or they take off. I am so excited to talk to my guest today. We're going to be talking about relationships. We're going to be talking about intimacy. We're going to be talking about human design, of course, um, and so many brilliant things. So Alana Pratt, welcome to the podcast. I am so honored to be on your podcast and so delighted to reconnect. You were such a hit on my podcast and uh, I love how deeply and quickly we dove in before. So thank you for literally being a kind of a human uh, who is connected and present and has done the work and we can go deep fast and be of greatest contribution to your, your viewers and listeners. So thank you for having me. And I'm noticing you're not wearing much 
much clothes and I'm wearing all my fuzzies because we're on the opposite side of the planet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's hot here. It's beautiful. It's my dream come true. I spent a lot of the day at the beach yesterday and I'll probably duck out at lunchtime again today because I can. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. I, I was the same. Like I felt like when we chatted, we just like connected really quickly. I absolutely love talking to you and I'm excited to really talk to you about a topic that I think a lot of people, I don't know, they they kind of, you know, skirt around the outsides of or they they live out a conditioned life through relationship and intimacy. But before we get to that, a couple of things for the listeners at home. Um, Alana is a 6-2 sacral generator, cross of obscuration. And just a fun fact, my husband is a cross of obscuration and they're, they're really relatively rare because you're a um a left angle um and prince harry so you're in really good yeah, exactly you're in really good company oh that's why i love prince harry okay got it we've got the same mojo going on there yeah. amazing yeah, and yeah so just to explain again to the viewers and listeners in my memory that's we're the type of people that when we see the elephant in the living room we say it we're like Basically. hey yeah and we piss people off a fair amount well, yeah, sometimes if they're not ready to hear it, that can definitely happen. But, you know, like I think what's fascinating is just looking that, you know, with Harry and I suppose Megan, but really Harry is bringing all of these secrets to light, whether it's the Netflix series or his book. And that's really what the Cross of Obscuration is all about. Now, mm. I, and I kind of feel like it's a lot of your work as well, because you probably work in areas that there's kind of a mainstream way that we should you know, we're conditioned to be in relationship and um, be intimate with people. Uh, and I suppose that a lot of your work is actually saying bullshit, you know, bullshit. That's not true. There's a whole nother way that we can be with another person. So what I would love you to do before we get to that, because of course I'm excited, I've jumped to, to you know, right to where we want to get to. However, I'd really love you to share your story with my listeners. Like I often say, most of us have a catalytic moment where we are, you know, it's the dark night of the soul. We're challenged where whatever we are. Um, and in that moment, we start, we really, you know, begin our purpose in the world and we begin this journey. And I'd love to hear a little bit about that moment and that journey that brings you to today, like what you are doing today and how you're impacting the world. Thank you. You know, I just did a speech at UCLA uh, a couple days ago, and it was a 15 minute version of that, but I will cut it down much, much uh, quicker. So I'm going to give you a little bit of how I left Canada. I'm a small town Canadian girl. Uncle Phil had a big 18 wheeler semi and he drove down to California once a month. So I quit college, much to my parents' chagrin, and I hopped on the semi because I just knew I didn't want to be a pharmacist like my dad or a teacher like my mom. I'd been a dancer all my life, and I thought, well, I'm just going to get a, dan a job on a cruise line and figure my life out. So I made it all the way to California, and I had the talent, but I didn't have the working visa. So with $40 left to my name, and all I had was my dad's credit card to turn around and go home and admit failure... I said, fuck that. I'm not going to go home. So I ended up getting a job dancing in Japan. And it was a, it was a topless review. And I didn't know that at the time. Uh, but there we were on this stage and there were all of these um, tattooed, drunk, not all the fingers, Yakuza, mafia, sitting around yeah. the edge of the stage with their little weenies hanging out, totally inebriated as we did like Madonna's Vogue. Um, and that was the first time, Emma, that I'm like, whoa, this is both horrifying and completely intriguing. Sexual mm. energy is a, is a thing, is a thing. But the choreographer knew I was so um, naive that everybody got a care package of vibrators and, you know, girly magazines, et cetera. But I got crayons and Crayolas because I was so, so like green. But during, uh, in between our contracts, I would go to backpack around Southeast Asia. And I went to Koh Phangan, Thailand, where the full moon rave parties were. And I would dance yeah. at night. But Emma, I decided in the day I would face my fears. And remember when you told me on my podcast, your Camino de Santiago, your, your, your pilgrimage, your walk, yeah. right? I didn't know that at the time. That's what I was doing. But that's what I did. I There's a misconception that showgirls have all this confidence. But most of the show showgirls I worked with were bulimic, 
anorexic heroin addicts. They hated their bodies and they were very competitive with other women. And Mm. so I hated my body. I was always comparing myself to other women. I didn't know how to receive a man's gaze without feeling all heebie-jeebie, like I was a piece of you know, meat, not a work of art. So I purposefully triggered my insecurities. All I wore was a floss G-string and I walked up and down that beach committed to learning how to feel at peace in my skin. Mm. And most days I just sobbed. I just sobbed. I just couldn't get out of my head. I couldn't stop hating my body. I couldn't stop looking at other people. And I had had, was renting this little $3 a night hut on the beach. So I was down at the far end of the beach and I just said, oh, fuck it. And I turned around defeated to walk back to my hut. And this was my first direct experience with the true nature of who we are. The sand, you know, fell out from underneath me. There was no gravity. I became one with like the droplets of the ocean, one with the rays of the sunshine, one with the waves, one with all the people all of a sudden became my best friend. And when I put my attention on my body, I just felt like this goddess, this bodhisattva. I felt peace in my skin for the very first time. And I was like, what the hell just happened? And it had something to do with commitment, intention, but surrender, nature, and just letting go. And I'm like, okay, if this freedom, as I walked back to my hut, like I floated back and I felt love and generosity. And I thought, okay, there's got to be some intimate relationship that we can all have with our bodies and the divine, and I'm going to figure this out. And that really opened the door to my whole career around intimacy. Wow. I've got head to toe goosebumps. And you know what I thought was like, as you were telling the story, there was part of me that wanted to ask the question, you know, like as much as I have always kind of assumed that a lot of women that go and, you know, work in those sort of places have low self-worth. There's also part of me that's like, is there part of you that feels almost empowered because you you can do these things that so many of us are, are, you know, we don't have the courage to do. And then you kind of answered my question by saying, you know, like, I just love the way that commitment of like, well, you know what, I don't care. I'm just going to put myself in the most uncomfortable situation because I want to have that love. I want to have that connection and that intimacy, as you say, with your body. And it's so funny because I can resonate with so much of what you said. Like one of my favorite things, and if this is too much information, listeners, I do apologize, but I'm going there. Um, You know, I love to walk around naked. However, one thing that uh, I noticed is that I'll only do it when I'm on my own. And like, I've had this conversation with my husband and it's like, it's not him, but it's the moment that there's someone, like when he's around, there is a level of obligation that pops in and all of a sudden I'm like, nah, I'm just putting these on, you know? Um, so I re- like, I love your whole story because the thought of walking down the beach in this tiny little G, um, just being like, oh my God, I love my body. And it's not because I'm showing it off to everyone else or I want anything from it or anyone else. It's because I fucking dig this body. Oh my mm-hmm. God. That's body goals for me. I love that story. Ah, uh, thank you. Well, I, it was only on the last turn back that I, you know, dig this body. I was very, very insecure up until then. It took a lot, just yeah. like you had that, it, that thought of like obligation. I had comparison and low self-worth. I had all the judgment. I remember my mom, I never told her that I was a topless dancer. Cause she used to say, Oh, those poor girls in Vegas, they have no life, no self-esteem, but I felt such freedom. Once I got back from Thailand and yeah. I got back to the club and I was dancing with all these other French girls and Australians and New Zealand's um, generally Canada and America, we seem to be the most repressed countries. Um, but we really enjoyed playing and knowing that we were like these sacred divine, uh, I don't know, like courtesans that Mm -hmm. our sacred sexuality could awaken the best, not only in the men, it could awaken their masculine grandeur. When we were like, thank you for noticing that I am a work of art. You can literally transform a man's attention by the way you breathe it in. Like, and it takes a courage because you got to open your heart to the, maybe their sliminess or their lack of nobility. But like uh, the monks in Tibet, Tonglen, where they breathe in the suffering of the world and they exhale love and compassion, you can do mm-hmm. the same for the man's attention. You can breathe in his maybe lower vibrational only bounce, energy. You can breathe it in 
you can affirm, yes, I am a divine temple. Thank you for noticing. And you can exhale that energy out. And I swear they change. They sit up or they take off because you have invited how you're going to be with this kind of energy based on your own belief, feelings, and embodiment of our, of our divinity. Wow. Oh my God. I love all of that. I think it is so incredibly powerful. And like, how do people, and obviously it took you a long time to get to that. And once you had that moment, um, Mm. which momentarily I'm thinking like, God, that's kind of like um, Eckhart Tolle, right? Just in a whole different way. Like, um, (laughs) you know, that moment, that divine moment, right? So after you had that experience, did it stick around? Did that, that like love of the body stick around? And then you could go in and do this work and feel, because I do feel that, you know, a lot of the time our conditioning is to think negatively um, and, you know, um, attack women and you'd be really unresourceful around women that maybe do topless dancing or all those sort of things. However, like I said, I think that there's also part of it that is total empowerment, you know, like total empowerment. So a, did you stay in that state of love and intimacy with your own body? So I'll answer this in two ways. One, no, because I'm a human, right? We contract, expand, contract, expand. We're always evolving. You're never going to get there. I mean, it's one thing to have that moment at 20, 21, another moment to give birth in front of, you know, the doctor and your everybody's there and your legs are splayed. And like, so, so there's always going to be more challenges to be vulnerable and transparent as we evolve as a woman, as a lover, as a mother. So, mm-hmm. but I did have context. You know, yeah. I knew I had touched oneness with my body and spirit. I, I knew where to, where I was looking. And mm-hmm. so I could get there faster, but was I permanently there? Hell no. So I would always have to return. And I created practices to return. Another curious thing that happened though, when I got back to the, the show with the French girls, they, with their little French accents. So the man likes it when the woman touches the woman. And I'm like, gross. I don't know. I don't understand what you're talking about. Um, And so, but we did this dance and I was like, wow, I like men, but I really enjoy being with other women sensually. That was really lovely. They're gorgeous. And then, oh my God, the whole room went quiet. I'm like, oh oh my God, this is, this is power. I'm Mm. in control. There's 300 people in the room and they went quiet as soon as this one girl, she did like a layback over the stairs and I put my hands through her breasts all the way to her neck and looked right in her eyes and everything went quiet. I'm like, she's right. And so I learned, um, and, and forgive me to say, I don't mean gross bisexual or lesbian or whatever. Like I love everyone and I love love, but I was still stuck in my own shame. Yeah. I was still in my own self-judgment. I was still stuck in trying to look good and not be judged. Um, but what I learned in that moment is the beauty of sisterhood, the beauty of celebrating our sisters. Like you're so beautiful, my sister, rather than being competitive with her. And I yeah. realized that there is a power in our sacred, and I'm using these words together, our sacred sexuality, because it is not okay. Human trafficking, like fuck no. Like there is, there are some hard lines that we need to change on this planet fast. And it's an invitation to sacredness. Where is the sacredness in our body? How can we honor the, 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 the feminine body? How can we see how she gives birth to life? Mm. She's gorgeous, whether she's your girlfriend, your friend, or your, your wife. And so I, one of the wonderful things I keep learning is how to be up under my sisters, mm-hmm. how to celebrate the beauty of my sisters, how to, even in front of um, maybe their partner is flirting a little too much with me. And that's not appropriate to, to how do I shift that energy and bring the two of them back together and step aside? Like I'm so aware of what it takes to really honor sacred sexuality. Oh my God. I love that. It's just, you know, like it's totally, and I want to come back to sacred sexuality because I think this is such a huge topic and so important, but I just want to share, like, you're absolutely right. I, um, you know, the female body, we are incredible and we've been so repressed and conditioned for the longest time. And I had this experience recently where 
Because I think as women, we don't even know it's happening. Like we are so unconscious. Like I'm a really conscious being. I've done 20 years of digging deep and, you know, I'll never be done. I get it. Um, I'm willing and able. I love the journey. However, yeah. I'm sitting in um, a room with, I just started doing this lymphatic drainage stuff and, oh, my God, it's so good, right? And I'm sitting there having, like I haven't even got on the table yet and we're having this conversation because, of course, we need to talk about all the things that's ever happened to my physical body and I'm going through my two pregnancies and then I talk about my second pregnancy. My second son is now 11 years old and for the first time in 11 years, I burst into tears and say how I felt, I'm going to do it again, how I felt completely brutalized, you know, like because it was an emergency cesarean, I was taken into this room. There was 15 men in that room. They literally just cut me open, like threw me around through the, and I was just like bawling my eyes out. And I was like, oh my God. And she was like, wow, that's an incredible release. Like having, obviously once we set the intention to do things, things already start to happen. And I remember saying to her, like, that's crazy. Up until this point, I didn't even know I was almost like, it was like, I wasn't allowed to have a trauma response. You know, I wasn't allowed to feel those feelings of, can everyone just slow the fuck down and take care of me and stop using, instead of, you know, treating me like a piece of meat kind of thing. And I just think that this all comes back to what you're saying. And I want to lead into this, like what specifically is sacred sexuality? Like how can we really love, respect and honour our bodies and ourselves when we do still live? Yes, we're transitioning into a much better world, I believe, but we we still do live in this world where we're not even aware of the conditioning that we're carrying as women. Oh, it's such first, I just want to give you a hug. I'm so sorry. And I'm so glad that you had the space to process that because the body keeps the score, right? It lives in our body subconsciously and we attract abuse or unkindness, or we push away love, intimacy, connection, money, success. And and it's subconscious. It's stuck with our bodies. So I'll answer this also in two ways. The first way, sacred sexuality, I I believe begins with ourself first right? How can we invite the touch the way we like it, the way that makes us feel safe, honored, and and celebrated? How can we experience rapture with another if we first haven't touched it within ourself? Mm -hmm. And so any of your self-touching, self-masturbation, oils, and if you just want to be in the fetal position and cry your face off, to me, that's sacred sexuality too, because you're honoring the body. You're honoring whether it's little you, or, or pregnant you or, or whatever. So always, and even when you look at yourself in the mirror, do you go straight for the cellulite and the wrinkles or do you go, Oh, behold, you goddess, look at you, lap your ass and, you know, you're ready turn yourself on. So it's very much a relationship with yourself to say, Hey, this body is conscious. This body is sacred. This body is my best friend. Hi, sweet body. And it can be a practice like a hand on the heart, hand on the yoni, morning and night. Just check in. What is it that you want me to know? And so that's mm. part one. Part two, in thank you for sharing about that trauma response to your to your second birth. I, in the last year, I can't remember how much I was interviewing you on my podcast, so I probably didn't share this, but, but about a year, a little bit of a year and a half ago, I was physically assaulted and my boyfriend was arrested. And there's, st- I'm still waiting for court. And, and you know what, Emma, I didn't tell anybody because I was so ashamed. Mm-hmm. Here I am this intimacy expert for the last 20 years. And I attracted the most charismatic, wealthy, attractive man in the room who kicked the shit out of me and verbally, oh. verbally used me. And so he had a lot of guns and I was terrified to leave. And I felt no one would believe me. And I was so ashamed that I stayed until it got so bad that he got arrested. So that's part one of that story. Part oh two, God. How, how did I do that? I am intelligent. I am conscious. I have done how many ayahuasca journeys? Like, come on, I'm awake. How did yeah. I do that? Well, my conscious mind clearly didn't do it. It was my subconscious. Yeah. So for the last year, I've been doing a lot of psychedelic somatic integration work using MDMA and cannabis blindfolded with practitioners in a process where no talky talk, just body sensation, emotion, body sensation, emotion. And I watched my body be molested as a kid and come from disassociation where we leave our body, 
yeah. back into my body. And then the memories came, the smells came, the sensations came and my body recapitulated, replayed all of that abuse until oh, it went all the way from level four, three, two, one back to still point. And I got to say, Emma, as horrendous as that awareness was and as courageous that was to go through that process. And yeah. I've been five, five series, five journeys. I finally forgave myself. That's why I attracted those abusive relationships. My mm-hmm. body was trying to survive the abuser. It was re it was just hypervigilant, hypervigilant. Where's the abuser to survive? Where's the abuser to survive? I go to a party. Where's the abuser? There he is. Let's marry him. Like I, that was what my body was doing. Yeah. And now it doesn't need to do that anymore. And I'm healed and I've forgiven myself. And I can literally say to my abuser now, thank you. Thank Mm. you. You were the catalyst to bring me home so that I can be in my hips. I was in my heart, Emma. I have a big humongous heart. And because of my disassociation, I can hear spirit. I can hear dead people. No problem. I thought I had an intuition, but I didn't. I wasn't in my hips. They were numb. They were numb. But now I'm back in there. And I feel discernment like I've never felt before. Wow. Confidence to speak up like I never have before. So if anybody's watching or listening and this trauma story of Emma's or mine is resonating, there is a way through and it is, it takes courage, but it is worth it and it works. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Oh my goodness. Like I can only imagine how challenging how challenging that would have been for someone who has spent such a long time working and doing all the things and still being so unconscious to, you know, the trauma that was living within your body. What was like, how did you actually take that first step? Because I feel like there are so many people out there that just know that there's something that's not quite right, you know, but yet they don't get the help because they go to, you know, GPs, or they go to very mainstream kind of um, practitioners that tell them that, oh, there's nothing wrong with you, just, you know, move on, or like all the tests come back clear. So how did you get the courage? And I know that you're already in this world, so you probably had resources. How did you actually get the courage? Like, how did you kind of go, obviously, you've had this relationship. Was it at that point that you went, okay, I know that there is something askew here. So how did you get the courage to actually go in that direction and maybe use a more alternative method or therapy. I've always, okay. There's two little deer out in the front yard kissing right now in the oh, snow. <laughs> so cute! I just had to say that they're just adorable. Um, so I have always been courageous and brave. I've always done the work. I always take the next level of coaching. Like I'll never stop. But when this happened and I went to the domestic violence shelter and they said, Oh, We normally don't see women as together as you here. We see them in the morgue. And I'm like, okay, it really shook me up. And they explained to me this domestic violence, um, batterer, um, abuser cycle. And it just helped me forgive myself enough to go, okay, I'm going to not hide this. I'm going to heal this and everything else I'd done up until now myself. I I've learned quantum psychology, spiritual technology, somatic integration. Like this is what I teach. Yeah. I have a land of coaches that I teach, but here's the difference. I only integrate what I can see. So if it's hopeless, suicidal, we can integrate that. If it's rage, frustration, we can integrate that. If it's sorrow, sobbing, we can integrate that. We can integrate what we can see. But what's different about the therapy that I went to is we were integrating what we can't see. Level four trauma, there's no body sensation and there's no emotion. So I couldn't find it within myself to self-process. Mm. And none of the people that I'd gone to thus far could process it because you couldn't see it because you leave the body. There's no body sensation. And the body's cold because it thinks it's dead. So all the blood goes to the organs. And so when I learned about this next kind of protocol, um, psychedelic somatic integration protocol. And we did the plant medicine with it. I said, Oh, I've done plant medicine. And she said, Oh no, you go way out to tier three, honey. You talk to spirit. We're going to do tier one. You sort of got your PhD before you got your bachelor's. We need to stay in the body. And thank God I've been trained as a dancer. Yeah. And I've been trained in allowance. All of the processes that I've been trained in, wherever the emotion comes up, we don't fix it. We don't change it. We just allow it. So I was very, very good at allowance, 
good at surrendering to the movement of the body, and I'm brave. And so that combination allowed this particular protocol to work quite quickly for me as I surrendered into circumstances and situations that were just gross. Yeah. And did you have like no awareness? Did you have no awareness that this had gone on? Like you'd completely, because I hear people all the time, clients all the time that sort of say, I don't remember my childhood. Like, was it that sort of thing? Like have had no awareness up until that point, except for the pattern that was playing out. I was aware of what I would call inappropriate behaviors, but not the full on. I mean, I went through, don't move, don't say anything. You made me do this and you like this, like freezing. That's Mm -hmm. what was lodged in my um, ANS system, my autonomic nervous system. And so I didn't, I had no memory of those molestations that occurred I, I only came back into the body to remember inappropriate touch from time to time, or just feeling really gross and icky and not safe that much. I could remember, but actually what had happened to my body, I disassociated and I, I had no memory when I came back in the body. That's when the memories, uh, flushed up the smells. You could feel the penetration in the vagina, your arms, my arms would go back against the ground and be held back just like it happened in the real thing. It was fascinating, fascinating. And then when the body uh, discharges all of the trauma, it shakes. So you have to be willing to look like an idiot and you're shaking in these all strange positions. You feel nauseous as you come back into stomach that which you weren't able to digest before. It's not fun. Um, But yeah, it was uh, hard to believe at first, but the, the sounds, even there was a time when I would protect my mom and my sister and just stand there like this. And that happened in my relationship. I remember one time there was an attack and I just stood there and my brain is like, get out. This is really dangerous. But my body was not going to move. And then when I did the PSI work, I was protecting my mom. No wonder I wouldn't, no wonder I wouldn't move. Yeah. So the body, the body is so wise. And if we give it these modalities to, to take it home, oh, I've just, I thought I was peaceful. I thought I knew what calmness was. Um, Certainly when I did like plant medicine journeys, I could touch oneness out there. Like we said, with the story in Thailand, I can touch oneness, but an embodied peace with your eyes wide open in the world. Mm. I'd never, I'd never experienced that before. And now I have. So I'm so- Oh my goodness. You've given me so many goosebumps and thank you so much. I feel like the power of this story, the power Mm -hmm. of you to be able to share this with people and- to speak to it with, you know, not dancing around like with direct language. I just think it's incredibly powerful because I feel there's so many women going through this in the world and they just don't, they, they, they have an inkling, like you say, but they just, they don't know what to do or where to go. And I just, every single time we hear someone else and we resonate with their journey, it just gives us that opportunity to be okay well maybe I can be brave maybe I can go and get that support as well so thank you so much for sharing I just think it's a powerful story you're welcome and for me now that I've gone through it and I can use my coaching to the next level with my clients uh, the greatest honor is to go into the darkness with somebody what does Joseph Campbell say the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek so to be right there with someone going through and say take me there take me to the darkness I'm right here and you go all the way through with someone to the other side, there are very few intimate moments on this planet than to walk with somebody home. It is the greatest privilege. Mm. Oh my God. I love that. And again, I just have to geek out just a little bit on your human design. Like that is the cross of obscuration. Like you're living it in your life. Um, There was a hidden truth and that truth came to light. And, you know, it's now gives you the power to, to, as you say, lead other people into their own cave and make it safe for them. So you're just a beautiful human. I so appreciate you, your story and what you do in the world. And I do want to talk about intimacy because I love that you just, again, like we've referred to intimacy in so many different um, parts of your story, you know, and it makes me just instantly go, well, yeah, because intimacy is more than just having sex with someone. So can we talk about that? Can we talk about like, let's just start with in your opinion and your experience, like what is intimacy? Mm. So way back like Latin intimacy, intimus 
inmost, innermost. So we're looking inside. We're looking inside. And to me, intimacy is about, can we be transparent with ourselves? Can we be vulnerable with our own feelings? Can we not turn away, but lean in when we have an emotion that comes up? Can we imagine if it helps with our mind's eye, little Emma, little Alana inside the heart, inside the gut, inside the voice, inside the vagina, wherever she is, or if there's gentlemen listening, he is, um, who needs us to listen, not fix, allow, be curious, tell me more. As long as it takes, like go inside and be with that emotion and say, I'm willing to sit with you for eternity. That's how much I love you. There's no rush here. And there's something really incredible when we begin to feel those raw feelings, breathe through them and be with ourselves. We come home, we come home into alignment. Uh, our heart opens. We have scientific coherence. The best of our brain turns on. We can hear our intuition. Like we're operating as our best self when we're able to cultivate this intimate connection and alignment with ourself. And it takes practice because you're out at dinner and your emotions come up and you're like, am I just going to like snot all over everybody at the dinner table? And we, you know, you push it down or you're about to pick up the kids and it's not appropriate. Like we're so good at pushing it away. Or even if we're alone, you know, no, I, I think I'm just going to go on social media. I think another glass of wine would do right. It, we're really good at pushing away emotions, but we all know what you resist persists and they grow they grow. And so it's really a commitment to say, Hey, if I'm looking to feel more seen, more gotten, more understood on the outside, if I'm craving more meaningful connection, more uh, rapturous touch, more ecstasy and surrender on the outside, but I'm not doing it on the inside. No offense, but that's batshit crazy. It's not going to work. You're going to have to go. Okay. The inside, I always say intimacy is an inside job. And so this is the practice that we have feeling our feelings and leaning in and opening our heart, splay it wide open in the face of anything. And then mm -hmm. that's a skill. That's a skill set. It's not about perfection. It's about building the capacity to be real. So that in a moment when you're talking with a friend and some tears come, came up, just like they did when you spoke of the, the uh, C-section, you kept talking, you were with your feelings, you felt them, you didn't check out, you didn't push them down. You just kept breathing. And then you kept talking, right? You were being what I would call intimate with that moment. And with me, you didn't say, oh, no, no, I won't talk about that. You didn't stuff mm -hmm. them down and put on a fake happy face. You mm -hmm. were just real. With me. So that's like a beautiful example of what it begins to look like to be intimate with the moment. And then when we can bring that into the bedroom and maybe he's touching your arm a little too fast and we don't judge. And we don't push away. We lean in and we go, oh, thank you so much. I love that you like to touch my arm. We praise, we, we, we honor, we're grateful. And then we say, oh, and it would just make me feel so juicy if you could slow down a thousand times. I think I would dissolve into the universe. You're my hero, right? Something like that. So we invite that which we ask for right in the moment. Mm. Or maybe we're making love and our, we're about to have an orgasm, but instead of it being this ecstasy thing, all of a sudden the tears flow. And do we allow ourselves and with our partner who might think that we're rejecting them or something's wrong? Can we give ourselves permission to just cry and yeah. sob and maybe say, this is, this is good. Please just be with me. Please just stay here. And then just let her rip and sob and have that moment of vulnerability. This, mm. these are different examples of being intimate. And then the last example I gave was just last night, flying back here to Wyoming. I sat down beside a lady, quick little flight. And, uh, she started talking, but I was present and I was listening. And I said, so how, how do you feel today? It was a real normal question. And she said, well, I'm a little scared. They found a lump and I'm mm -hmm. having an operation in two weeks. And I said, how do you feel about that? I didn't say, oh, well, it's going to be fine. It'll be fine. Right. I didn't, I didn't gloss over it. I went mm -hmm. deeper I said, and how does that make you feel? She's like, yeah, I'm scared. Go got it. Who's going to be there with you? Well, I don't want my kids there. Cause then they got the grandkids. So my niece, my niece is going to be there. I go, that's brilliant. So we just had this beautiful, intimate conversation. Mm -hmm. And because the intimacy went in the figure eight, that direction, when she said, so why did you move to this little town in the middle of nowhere? I said, well, I was, I had criminal assault. I wanted to hide and heal. And I told her what I just told you. Yeah. And she said, oh, it brought tears to her eyes. And she said, oh, you're so brave. 
And here we are on a 45 minute flight with a total stranger intimately connected. So it's a, I love it. It's a skill that we can use everywhere with everyone. Oh my God. I love it. Love it. Love it so much. And it's funny. I feel like I resonate with it. You know, I've always kind of been that human. I can't stand around and talk about the weather. If we're not going to (laughs) go deep and like intimate, I'm going to use that word. I love it. Um, then I'm kind of not interested. You know, I want to dive in. I want to, um, yeah, just, just know more. And I love, I just quickly, I want to geek out on your human design. You've got a wide open G center. So that actually gives you this natural ability to almost be chameleon like, like you can, you can morph into whoever you need to be or connect with or whatever. I have an open G center as well. And that's the way it plays out for me. And I just think that's, I just, I love it. I love to geek out. And I want to, I want to also reflect on a couple of things. Um, Number one, I was watching this great Australian series. It's called, um, I think it's called What Women Like or something like that. And basically it's this TV series where um, this, you know, 40 something, maybe 50 something actually, 50 something woman married to her husband, kids have moved out of out of home. She gets retrenched. Um, and the job that she had before she gets retrenched was uh, she worked in a business that takes over bankrupt businesses or something. And she goes into this business just before she loses the job and meets these guys and they're removalists. Long story short, she gets retrenched. And then for some reason, she starts to try and help this business because she's like, this doesn't need to be, you know, um, ended. Anyway, and what actually ends up happening is that these guys who were removalists, they actually end up being, she sort of starts this business and turns it into this business where they go to people's houses, women's houses, and they clean their house as in like an intimacy and, and almost like an erotic thing. And then of course it also moves into um, sex and all this sort of stuff, but she's, it's the funniest show and it's so powerful because she's not, you know, sexy or um, anything like that. She's just this ordinary woman. And there's this moment where one of the guys says to this one of the women, he, um, he says like, you know, there's nothing I find sexier than when my girlfriend just tells me what she wants. And like the next scene is this woman with her husband saying, well, this is what I want. I want to go to the bedroom. I want you to slowly undress me. And she goes through all this thing and her husband literally nearly melts in that moment. And I'm like, I actually sat there and for a moment, I'm like, shit, I, I just, I don't even think about like, that's, it hadn't even occurred to me. Just ask directly for what you want. And mm. I think that we're so conditioned to just be, yeah. especially when we have children and businesses and all these other things that are going on that you kind of like, like everything else, it almost becomes, you know, intimacy becomes a habit. And I know the intimacy that I love the most with my husband is the fact that we connect so deeply, like the conversations that we have, the vulnerability that we have, the honesty that we have, um, the fact that we can fully be ourselves, like that's the intimacy that that I really treasure. Like I love all the other stuff too, all the physical stuff, that's great. But there's, for me, it's the fact that that deep trust and that deep being held, like that's my ultimate, ultimate um, intimacy. But yeah, I love it. I, I think you need to speak a little bit more. There was something else I was going to touch on, but maybe I'll come back to it. But so let's say, inspired by this character of this TV series, let's say there's people out there listening and they're like, oh, Alana, I want more intimacy in my life. You know, I've got lots, I've got kids and work and all this shit going on and I'm, you know, pre-menopausal or um, just too busy. How do women start to experience more intimacy? Obviously they start with themselves, but what's the path? Like how can you really start to bring intimacy back into your into your life um, once you start to build, reconnect with that intimacy with yourself. Yeah. Structure creates freedom. We have to create structure for intimate time. We have to get a sitter. We have to let the kids have a sleepover. We have to have a date night. We have to go away for a night or the weekend. We have to structure it and make it a priority because we all know that 24 hours in a day is already 26. We're trying to squish 26 into 24 as we already are, right? We're not going to find more quote unquote time. Um, And for me, intimacy is only true, true, deep intimacy is only possible when I'm safe. 
And if I think the yeah. kids are going to walk in or I can hear them in the other room, I'm not present. And then it's a half ass experience. So really to cre- be creative, think outside the box and create the structure so that you can go in. Um, mm-hmm. The second is that it's a lot of conversation. Uh, you can even make the conversation happen in the normal day. You can say, so tell me, maybe the kids are in the back seat with their earphones on. Tell me something that about you and oral sex. And then whisper as you're driving the kids to school or so they're in the back with the headphones on. I don't know, but start to have conversations that dive in. Tell me a way you like to be touched. Tell me um, a way you like to be loved. Tell me a fantasy of yours. Like we start to ask questions and get the juice flowing so that we actually know, and then we communicate. So we set up our partner to win, right? Um, And then also when you're having your time away, foreplay up the wazoo. Like what if you could only speak with your movement, no words, and, and tell him what you wanted just with your body. One of my great fantasies, I'm calling in my next partner, is that at the end of the day, I want to put my pole up, my pole dancing thing, and I want to show him my day through my body. And maybe I'm pissed. And maybe I'm in the fetal position. And maybe I'm like totally orgasmic. Or maybe I'm a dork. Um, But I want to show him my day through my body, less words. And I want more of me to come out because of his presence, Mm. because he's just me in and experience after all I've been through experience that safety and that absolute present man and, and allow my expression to awaken something more in him, which awakens something more in me, which awakens something more in him. And really imagine this figure eight where one and one is not two, it's one and one is infinity and how we can be together. And so you express with your partner, are you more into sensuality, like my furry vest here? Are you more into, let's just get it on and do it in the laundry room or close the closet door and just say, cleaning the closet, we need to clean the closet. And you just head in there for a quickie. Or maybe you're very much about take your take your dress off, turn around, take your undies off. Like maybe it's more of this energetic play, or maybe it's kink. Maybe you really want, you're such a woman in control of your whole life and you've got a big business and you want to be in ways that work for you, maybe ropes on your wrists or, or tied up in a certain way, or just a blindfold and fed food that you don't know what he's going to feed you blindfolded just so that you have to surrender let go of control and trust. There's a lot of different ways you can play with sensuality, sexuality, and intimacy, but it really comes down to what you just said, this honest, vulnerable, transparent communication so that you're setting each other up to win and finding areas where both of you agree and feel safe and honored to play. Mm, I love it. I love it so much. It's interesting you say you know, that whole um, safety piece around the kids as well. Like that's been a big issue for me. Like if the kids are in the house, I'm, I always have an ear out, you know, I always like, like even if, so um, I love that idea of being able to get like, oh no, you're allowed to have full safety. You're allowed to have those things. Um, But do you know what I want to ask you? Because I feel like, and I know that I was at this place. So I want to ask this question because you know, like you're obviously, you're confident and you know what you're talking about and you know what you want. But what about these these people who are listening? They're like, yeah, I want all that. I want to do that. And I want to say that. And oh my God, I want to say it like Alana because she is sexy and fun and playful. You know, you've got this beautiful energy that's not intimidating. Like it's this, I love what you, um, you know, it's that sacred sexual energy, but often a lot of people in this area you know, they can be quite intimidating and almost too much. And you've just got this beautiful balance of everything. So I just wanted to say that Um, very approachable, very like I can imagine that that's probably why people really want to work with you because it's like, I want what she's got and I'm not afraid of her. So it's all really good. But (laughs) can you you maybe help people? Because I know for me, when I was sort of going down this road, I was like, I'm so embarrassed. I don't even know where to start. I don't know what to say, you know, like, I, you know, can I turn around and stand in the other room and talk to him through a wall? Like, how can people navigate that, um, you know, that that fear, that palpable fear of being vulnerable? And yes, this is the person that you want to be intimate with, but especially when there's all these other things going on in the life. I don't know about other women, but there was a whole part of me that just shut down when my kids were little. So yeah. 
how can people start to navigate this to to start to um, nurture and grow what you have? Because mm. yeah, what what exudes from you is beautiful. I want some of that. So how can we start if we're timid and scared and and afraid of being vulnerable and, and open hearted? How can we tiptoe in that direction? Or how do we and or how do we navigate that fear of rejection or embarrassment or the, those sort of emotions? Yeah. So again, structure creates freedom. So there's lots of ways um, to, to be in my presence, like with group coaching. There is what I call heartmates, heartmates.app. That's for the singles. For the couples, go to my website, alanapratt.com, and there's heartmates for couples. And there's a curriculum that you can go through. But the piece that I think is going to be most important for the practicing of the fear of rejection is what we do every single week. And they're called conscious connection calls. Um, and what we do are our dyads and dyads are somebody says something that's a question. The other one answers and the person who asked it, all they get to say is thank you. And thank you doesn't even mean they agree. And then you switch. So those questions that I was uh, referring to earlier, like, tell me something about you and sex. Tell me something that uh, really turns you on. Tell me what it takes for you to feel safe to open up. Tell me what you're afraid to tell me. These kind of questions when asked back and forth with your partner, not naked in the bedroom, but out for dinner, out for a walk, mm. go for a bike ride, go for a drive. And so you don't even have to look right in each other's eyes. Um, and then, you know, the rules are the other person can only say thank you. So you're not going to get rejected. So you start mm. to practice every single week on these conscious connection calls, along with the curriculum, where there's some inner work and there's some other conversations. So I've created these curriculums so that people can take baby steps because I've been working at this for 20 years yeah. and you saw it even last year, I'm still a work in progress, right? So yeah. we never get there. Yeah. So the idea is what if once a week you did dyads with your partner, mm. and you talked about love that. stuff yeah, and You'll find, tell me something about you and oral sex. It's really hard not to get turned on and it generally leads to something afterwards or even like little, little, you can even do it like little texting. Thank yeah. you. Right. Just to build the, like a, a house, got to put the bricks one at a time. And then all of a sudden you'll be in the bedroom and you'll have the courage because you've been practicing, or you could even say, remember what we were talking about uh, with that dyad we did on Thursday night? Oh my God, I would be so juicy if we could do that tonight. And you practice being alluring. You practice being inviting. You practice being welcoming. And it goes all the way back to the beginning with what we said about intimacy. Fear of rejection isn't as bad when you don't reject yourself. Yeah. When you have your own back, when come hell or high water, you look in the mirror and say, hey, hot stuff, you know, you got it going on. Whether because you're going to get hurt. It's not going to go perfectly. There's going to be yeah. some wobbles, and some bumps. You're going to have to have a rupture and then a repair. It's called life. So we yeah. can't let that be the reason we don't step forward. Um, but if we have our own back and we're kind to our own body, it makes a huge difference in terms of your courage to speak up. And then the last thing, when it goes well, um, praise, appreciate, let's yeah. really celebrate like, oh my God, last night, like say it for a week, last Thursday, last Thursday, like you just keep saying it. And then that confidence comes up and then he'll remember that. Yeah. And, and you both grow and learn how each other wants to be cherished and treasured. Oh. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And I think like one of the things I know for, um, my husband and I, like Justin and I just got to the point, like, instead of being embarrassed, why don't we just laugh about it? That was kind of our go-to. We were just like, okay, sure. let's just laugh about it. Um, because you know, like that releases that nervous tension, but it's also keeping it light. You know, the, the world doesn't yeah. depend on this, it's, you know, um, I love that. And, you know, as you were speaking, what I want to say also is for all the people who are listening to this podcast, I bet you find time to, you know, um, study human design. I bet you find time to meditate. And if you don't, I know that most of you are, you know, building a habit of that, you know, you yeah. find time for those things that are important. And I, I really believe, and I, I know for my journey, and I'm so not, a, you know, an expert at this, but for me, I know that as I built that intimacy with myself and yeah. then we consciously, um, you know, tried to, practice that intimacy together and a big part of it for us as well was like breaking social norms like one of my best friends when I was younger her and her husband you know Wednesday night was the night every week um and 
that scared me when I was in my twenties, I'm like, well, what if I want to do it every day? And then what if I don't want to do it for a whole week? Like, oh my God, I don't want to be told I have to do it every, and it properly freaked me out for a long time. Um, yeah. So I think it's also that piece of, okay, going down that road and, and like you would, let's say you're learning to meditate or you're learning to do any other skill, like just dedicating time every day um, to, to transform. And do yeah. you, do you find like in, in your work, do you find often, like, do people ha- ca- carry a lot of like sexual trauma or fear yeah. and those sort of things? And is that something that you help people sort of shift through this whole process? A hundred percent. Tell me one person who has not been rejected. I've never yeah. met one. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Tell me one person who's not been rejected by the way they kiss or the way they make love or, or what turns them on. We've all been rejected somewhere, sometime. I haven't met anybody. And so, yeah, we need to learn how to heal that wound within ourselves, and then see the gift in that rejection because it brought us home to not reject ourselves, improve our communication skills, not shut down, be brave and open up, learn to be alluring. There's so many things we learn from those traumas when we work through them. Um, mm-hmm. So, so there's, so you're not alone, I guess is what I'm saying. Every single client ever has had some sort of rejection on some level, but here's the cool thing. When you start to have that uh, bravery to communicate with your partner about that, you don't always have to be in the mood. Like if you're going to have sex on Wednesday nights and you're really not in the mood on Wednesday night, you get to practice that too. Well, it's Wednesday night. I'm really not in the mood. You can start to say, well, could I get you in the mood? What would it take to get you in the mood? Oh, I need to have a cry or I need to shave my legs or, oh my God, there's got to unpack something from the car. Well, so ask, ask for what you need until you're in the mood. And then if you're really, 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 really not in the mood, then go say, go take care of yourself. Go, go masturbate, go take care of yourself. Because if one has a desire, what are the chances that we're robots and we're both having the exact same desire at the exact same yeah. time for the rest of our life? It's not going to happen. So there's, there's um flexibility, honesty, vulnerability, and then yeah. we'll kind of come back in an hour or how about tomorrow night? Don't give up and stonewall and, and go elsewhere with your desires, lean in bravely, intimately, and, and figure it out together. Certainly Mm -hmm. after, I mean, when I was a new mom, I just wanted nothing to do with it. I didn't know where the hell my libido was. And during a lot, to be honest, during a lot of my trauma, um, healing over the last year, when I finally came back into my body, I felt like this little baby bud growing out of the ground. I didn't have a libido at all. And I was like, Oh no, she's so precious. I don't even want to look at anyone. And I let that be okay for a while. My vibrators gathered dust for a while. I just wasn't in the mood until I was. And so trust the process as well. And don't compare yourself to others and just stay in open communication with your partner. Um, And yeah, yeah, creative. I think that's brilliant. And you know, when you were speaking, I was the only other thing I wanted to add is then just don't assume because this was me. Don't assume mm. that every other woman on the planet is a sexual goddess and you just haven't worked it out. That's what that's what I used to think when I was younger. I'm like, well, everyone else seems like they've they're nailing it. I mean, what would I know? I'm not there in the bedroom with them. How would I know? But yeah, right. I think you know that that comparison I just but oh my god, Alana, it's been so beautiful talking to you. Um, I always feel like it's just not enough time, but I do want to respect your time and let you go. But How can people find you? Where do they find you? How can they work with you? Wonderful. Yeah. My site has all sorts of complimentary resources. I'd love them to go there. So it's my name, alanapratt.com. And there is a intimacy blind spot assessment there. There is a top five mistakes that destroy conscious relationships. There's books, there's meditations, there's a YouTube channel. There's my podcast where they can listen to us as well called Intimate Conversations. And then also on my site, if you're like, no, I really want to look into working with this woman, there's an intimacy breakthrough experience call with me, which is hugely valuable. I'll get right down to what's actually going on. It's often a blind spot. I can't see mine either, so don't worry. But when we get to the core, that's the most efficient way to get the results that you're looking for intimately with yourself, with your body, with the divine, with your beloved. 
It's also intimacy everywhere with your children being present with them, intimacy with your money, your vocation, your purpose. It Everything is a relationship. Yeah. So to me, intimacy is the core fundamental building block of our self-realization. It's so powerful to do this deep work. And I would love to support people, especially anyone that's going through any of this trauma. And they're just like, what the hell's going on? I'm clever. I can't seem to get this right. I would love the honor of supporting you through that. Because to be on the other side is a freedom I've never known. And all of us have this birthright. Mm. Oh my God. I love all of that. That's so beautiful. And before Mm -hmm. I let you go, I do want to share something pretty awesome. When I said before, there's two things that I wanted to share. Um, Intuitively, this thing that I was studying the other day from the gene keys, which I don't know if you know the gene keys, but they're like an extension of human design. Um, and I was looking at the gate 36 and as you were talking, like it just keeps coming into my, my intuition is just like tapping me on the shoulder, tell the story, tell the story. And I've just looked at your design and you actually have the gate 36 and what this is all about. And it's in your Mars, which means your personality Mars, which means it's like this lesson that you start in immaturity and then you, you become very wise in this particular Mm. area. And the gate 36 in its um, shadow state, it's all about turbulence. So it's all up and down and all over the place. And, um, you know, it can't ground into anything. But then as it moves into the gift, it's um, humanity. And what this gift is all about is the ability to stay open hearted in any emotional situation. And I just love what you're talking about. Because I'm like, yep, there it is in your chart. It's right there. Um, wow. And it's played such a big role in, yeah. you know, who you are and who you've become and how you're serving the world. So you're uh, awesome. Thank you for that reflection. That was my speech I did a couple of days ago at UCLA in LA was all about splay your heart wide open. So thank you for that reflection. That feels so good. Oh, you're amazing. amazing. Thank you oh. for having me. Thank you. Well, you're so welcome. I, as I said, I could talk to you all day. I think you're absolutely brilliant. Um, Everyone, you know, if this, if this has resonated with you, please go look her up, check out the podcast and um, yeah, the website and everything else. So thank you so much, Alana, for being here. I've loved talking to you. Likewise, my love until next time. Yeah. Thanks everyone for being here. I trust you got what you needed and I look forward to having you on the the next podcast. Bye for now. Thanks everyone for being here all the way to the end of the podcast. I hope you got lots of value out of it. I certainly had a lot of fun doing it. Could I please ask that you share this podcast with friends if you found it valuable? And also, bonus points, Could you leave a review for me as well on Apple? It would be greatly appreciated. If at any point you would like to be on the podcast or you've got questions that you'd like me to discuss on the podcast, by all means, get on my socials and DM me. Everything you need is there in the show notes. Have an awesome day. Bye for now.